Again, um, welcome everybody. I'm Arne van Alstrevere, the, the Chief Learning Officer at the Consortium for Service Innovation, and I lead the training and certification arm of the consortium. And Kendall, the next slide. Um, the, um, yeah, there we go. Uh, consortium is a nonprofit alliance of member companies developing innovative ways to improve engagement, and that engagement in a variety of areas, including customer service, HR support, IT support, sales, and customer success, to name a few. And next slide. We are funded predominantly by our member companies and want to thank them for their ongoing support. And included here are the benefactor and sponsor level members. And then also want to make sure you're aware of upcoming events on the next slide. And so in June, come here from SAP on their innovative mm -hmm. approach to knowledge article scoring. And then in July, we're gonna have a KCS Align vendor, XFIND, to explore the new capabilities and concepts of AI in customer support. And Jennifer Morcat, our community success manager, will be posting a link to the events in chat. And then for today's KCS in action, I am pleased to introduce Alina Weber. So on the next slide, and Alina is a change strategist and having a change management plan is a key part of any KCS deployment. And Alina, as you can see, has a, a wealth of uh, knowledge on change management, and she'll be sharing that, as well as specifics of how F5 applied change management uh, to their program. But some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be posted on the consortium site, as well as sent out to all who have registered. But please put yourself on mute during this event and post your questions in chat. And Kendall Bernaisi and others from the F5 team will be monitoring the chat and will either answer them in the chat, bring them up as appropriate to lean in the flow, or save them for the Q&A session at the end. And then we're going to include the final chat transcript along with the presentation and recording in our email to those who have registered. And also, Alina welcomes people to connect on LinkedIn with her and send any questions you didn't get answered today or additional questions you think of later. But I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to Alina. Excellent. Uh, Arnfred, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, in the next slide, we're going to explore how we're going to spend uh, approximately the next hour together. So if I were you, I would say, okay, how are we going to spend this time? And I am very excited that throughout our remaining time together, we'll be consistently, constantly asking what I hope uh, are intelligent questions. Every question is good, but intelligent questions lead you to discovery, and we're going to focus on those. Uh, we're going to learn from current real-life scenarios with the F5 team, how this, how this is work in real life, and hopefully we're going to leave with a digital library of knowledge, which will then enable us to harness our collective wisdom and get back to work. So if that's something that you're interested in. You're in the right place. There's still time to bail out if not. <laughs> so here we go. The first uh, next slide, the first question I would have in, in your shoes is, can you please define some change management terms? Change management is a term used in, in a variety of ways. What actually is it? Well, for our purposes today and for the majority of my career, I've worked in framework for managing the people side of change versus the technical side of change management. Uh, change management methodology is actually founded on set principles and follows a structured approach similar to KCS. The methodology that I have used and have had success with is the PROSI methodology. So that's what will be referenced in terms of methodology. Uh, change managers are simply the coaches who guide the sponsors, executive leaders, uh, program people managers, by providing a structure for them, data insights that inform their decisions, a roadmap, and the people impact at every stage of the transition. And that's throughout the lifetime of the program. The strategist will do organizational change management. Uh, their business acumen and experience will inform executive leadership. They have a seat at the table generally, and they measure those ROI factors like speed of adoption, ultimate utilization, proficiency back to uh, the project to show if a project's been indeed successful. So those are some, some terms for you. Um, in the next, next slide, we're gonna look at 
Um, how is the framework for change management created? Well, like every, every good methodology, it rests upon some tenants. And there are five tenants in the ProSide methodology that answer the questions on the right. So the questions on the right are, why are we changing? Who has to do their job differently? How much of our outcomes depend on adoption and usage? And what will we do to support that adoption and usage um, to drive, uh, you know, to improve results? So basically, we're driving adoption and usage for a reason to improve results. So the tenants are we change for a reason. When orgs change, that requires individuals to change. And that organizational outcomes are actually the collective result of individual change. So then change management, uh, change management becoming that enabling framework for managing the people side will then apply uh, structure to the team to be able to measure success, to be able to measure their human ROI factors and ultimately link to the success criteria. So you're asking yourself, that's that's great, but why would I need a structured change management methodology as a KCS program manager or coach or a leader in the room? So I don't know if you've noticed, but change is hard. Um, the more significant and radical a change, uh, that will invite resistance. Resistance generally comes from a disruption to our comfort zone, and that's why we need a trusted, structured approach to deal with that resistance. Hence, we need change management. So uh, basically, that's that's where our starting premise is. And to make it easy, to make this methodology kind of easy to capture, uh, what we're going to do is look at just a couple of things. So I'm going to give you three things um, that are going to be as easy as one, two, three, and ABC. So start singing that Jackson 5 tune in your head, because that'll actually help you to remember. So one, two, three, what does that mean? What What is inside this methodology? What are the engines that drive this methodology? And then later we'll look at how to apply it. So the first uh, three, uh, the, the most important three are the project, um, the PPP as it's called, PPPP, four Ps, uh, connects the people to the purpose. The PCT is a data-driven uh, measurable way to connect leadership to the program. And the ad car is an individual mo model for managing resistance. So these are the three. And I'll give you just the at a glance in the next slide uh, of what these kind of look like. And I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of time because I'm not as much interested in teaching you uh, the methodology uh, nitty gritty details as I am on how to actually use uh, tools from the methodology to help you in your in your program. So the four Ps are simply connecting the purpose to the people. Um, and that basically has to be very specifically tied to the success criteria, the reasons why the changes are happening, and have an accurate representation of all the impacted groups. Because if you don't connect the people to the purpose, sometimes uh, resistance will creep in a lot heavier than than just the just normal. So make sure that when you lay this out, this at a glance, you have this always before you connecting the people to to the um, to the purpose of why you're doing it in the first place. Um, in the project change triangle, this is how all of the dots connect. So the PCT is a way in which we look at the leadership roles the technical side of the house, which is the left side, and then the change management. And here is how they're interconnected. Leadership makes their strategic plays. They say, we want KCS. We want this program to, to be our methodology for how support organizations are going to move the needle to customer success. They have a technical side, a project management team. They have the KCS program managers, and they build the program. But well, what generally happens is that change management is either not fully uh, framed to support that, or it's perceived as communications, training, uh, will tell you what needs to happen, and the change managers will make sure that the people get it on time. That's not quite how this should work. The reason is that executive actions that impact people have to 
immediately uh, presuppose that there will be some resistance from the people, whatever levels they are. And the first level will be the people managers and then everyone underneath. So that's why we need to have change management actually built out and structured in such a way that it constantly gets in the same room uh, with leaders and project managers. So your change manager, your leaders, and your project team and program team should always be in a room together more often than you think. I would suggest minimally once a week for meetings and getting on the same page. That is going to affect a lot of how uh, resistance management um, is mitigated. So uh, in the next slide, we're going to cover the ad car model. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on this because this to me is probably the most useful of, of, the, of all. And why I say that, we went back, if we go back just a couple of slides where organizational change means individual change. Well, each individual changes at a different rate, at a different pace. So this particular model, think of it as as a sort of a sequential, it could be iter iterative, and I'll explain that in a minute, but it's a sequential way that everyone goes through a change. The first time someone's introduced to something, and most of you might be in the middle of the program, so this may not apply, but if you're in the room considering launching KCS, the first thing you need to know is people will ask, why do we need to change? Why now? How? What happens if we don't? If you manage to create a good awareness campaign, and inform uh, le leaders, inform the managers, and managers informing the people in that order, then people will then be invited to participate in the change. So they'll say things like, sure, this sounds good to me. I'm, I've decided to participate in this. This sounds like a great idea. Show me how. Then you send them to the KCS practices, the coaching practices, if you have uh, coaching um, programs in your organization. And all of this is wonderful. And then it's time to actually write articles. It's actually time to go through, um, you know, content uh, checklist. It's time to do a par review. And then all of a sudden people go, oh, wait, this isn't exactly what I, what I thought it was going to be, or it's too hard, or it's taking too much time. You know, all the things uh, of why we have resistance management uh, articles and why, why this happens. And then they'll go backwards into uh, into uh, not having the desire any longer to participate. So to take people from K to A to the knowledge of how uh, KCS works, how to do KCS accurately, how to do the solve loop, the evolve loop, you then have to have very uh, secure uh, landing places for them to know how to do it. The proficiency is in the ability section of the ATCAR model. And then that's not even sufficient because when you have a program that's pretty much going well, it's growing, you're seeing great results, you still have to work on reinforcement. And reinforcement are mechanisms that you put in place so people don't go back to their old ways. So this is how this ADCAR model works. And uh, and I and we'll see later in our story uh, when the team comes in, how missing elements, next slide, missing elements of the ADCAR can get you into trouble. So what happens if you don't have awareness and desire really uh, captured well? And I would say this should be early on. If you're in the middle of the program and you're still struggling with folks in awareness and desire, uh, you'll need you'll need different kinds of help. Uh, but if you're sort of at the beginning of the program, there's still an opportunity to infuse awareness and desire. Um, if you miss it, Without awareness and desire, you can see that people start asking the same questions over and over. There's lower productivity. Um, if you don't correctly train and send people to, to, the, to the training classes and, and coach, coaches are not seeing uh, sort of that knowledge that is essential, you'll have lower utilization. You'll have people sort of uh, having workarounds, they'll get creative, they'll make their own apps, they'll make their own systems, they'll, they'll do anything they have to do to get around um, doing things properly in the tools that you've decided would be best to capture uh, the workflow. So it's very problematic without knowledge and ability. And then if you don't do reinforcement, like I said, people will go back to their old ways. So in the next slide, 
just briefly, I want to show you how these two engines connect. Uh, the Otkar model represents the bottom right of the corner. So I said, you know, leadership's in play, program managers in play, but the right side is really this whole entire Atkar engine is what, what drives change management methodology uh, to then be able to get people into a framework where things can be measured. So maybe I made this joke uh, with some of you in the room before. A lot of change management methodologies are, are interesting. Um, some of them are, are very, uh, you know, uh, psychology driven, human psychology driven, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the reason that ProSci is valuable is because the methodology has tracking devices in it. It has ROI measuring data um, embedded into the program that you, you can extract. And then those data insights will inform the decisions and it will uh, flow very similarly like the project uh, roadmap. There is a roadmap for change management embedded in this methodology. Not only can you stay on the same page, but then you'll be able to measure activities in between iterations. Uh, it works very well with Agile, with Lean. So this is why of all the methodologies that I have been exposed to, uh, if you're doing org design, Potter is your best friend. If you're doing project work, program work, the ProSci methodology um, is is very, very useful for the for that reason. So there's my plug for ProSci. <laughs> um, all right, next slide. Let's introduce some some characters to the cast. Okay, so we we went through uh, why we need a framework, why we need a methodology, what some of the components of the methodology are, but who is going to be using this? How how does this all work? We're going to focus on two employee facing roles because they're the most critical roles when considering change management. It's not your change manager. The change manager is somewhere behind the curtain. It's like a stage manager of a play. They're not the main thing. Main players are the executive leaders and the people managers. And in the next slide, we'll see the executive leaders. Here's your ABCs. We learned the one, two, three, your ABCs. Your executive leaders, your primary sponsors need to know their ABCs. That means they need to be active and visible throughout the lifetime of the project. They need to build a solid leadership coalition. So it can't just be one. There has to be every group that's impacted, uh, their leader, the leader of that group needs to be in this coalition. And then they have to be willing to communicate directly with employees. They must not, should not delegate direct employee communication to a comms team or a change manager. Um, communications about the, the why, the why now. Uh, taking people through that ad car journey is just as much a a, a leadership responsibility as it is the change manager's responsibility. In fact, some, some folks don't even have a, a change manager. So it becomes even more important that key sponsors, primary sponsors will do their ABCs so that employees get to be informed and informed in a timely manner. They're equipped, uh, they're trained, and they're aligned to the organizational mission because it will drive their decision to participate. When you've got an executive leadership driving uh, the communication, they show up at town halls, they show up at, at uh, critical meetings, critical milestones in the program, that makes a huge difference. The other uh, the other uh, party that's, that's very important, the other actor on the stage are the people managers. And for the coaches in the room, you right now should know that if the people managers are are not uh, on board, life is very difficult. People managers are those that employee trust. They're the closest to where the action happens. They've been there forever. Um, at the top, leaders come, leaders go. You may have had different sponsors take over the program, but the people managers are your steady middle. And they're the ones that actually mitigate resistance. They're the ones that build support. And they are the preferred sender of the WIFM, the what's in it for me messages. So they're also preferred senders, just like the executive uh, leaders and the sponsors. In the next slide, we're going to see that in addition to fulfilling the day-to-day -day managerial duties that they have, right, they also need to 
I'm, I'm referencing a superhero here, they also need to basically be ready to put on the costume uh, to, to show up from, you know, basically regular every day to Superman or Superwoman and do their communicator role, the liaison role uh, to advocate uh, and be a resistance manager and a coach. So in this case, the people managers and the coaches, uh, which is why I love uh, that KCS has such a robust coaching program, they, they need to be working hand in hand. Uh, coaches don't have the, the authority over the people necessarily. They're not their direct manager. The direct manager sometimes doesn't have that C muscle, the coaching muscle. And yet the resistance manager and coach, those last two, the R and the C are the most important things. And so to the extent that coaches uh, can train, can help the people managers be their, you know, their their full superhero self, that will actually drive a lot of the, the success in, in mitigating resistance. So Okay, we've talked a lot about methodology and uh, we've talked a lot about all kinds of structural needs for change management, but let's look at how some some of these things play out. So today I have Kendall Bernice with me, Gary, and several others uh, from the uh, F5 team that have lived and breathed the KCS program with and without change management. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kendall now to, uh, to basically tell you why formal change management is critical. It took me a minute there to find a mute button. Yeah, thanks, Alina. <laughs> um, yeah, as, as as Alina alluded to, um, we at F5, um, while at our core, we're, we're a company that's building applications to help you all get around the world and, and interact with work like we're doing today on Zoom, meet people, and ultimately at the end of the day, relax. As a business, we're all about being for people. Um, as an organization, we uh, we have a KCS program um, that has about 500 to 600 knowledge workers, licensed people at, at any given moment. And um, in a past presentation, some of you might remember that we started our KCS program at F5 back in 2016, 2017. Um, but what we did at that time was we launched without a coaching program, without a change management program. And we made a lot of mistakes along the way, shall I say, right, Alina? Um, and uh, one of them was not starting with change management. And when, when Alina joins us to consult and strategize with us around how do, we, how do we right some of those wrongs, one of the things that became really apparent to us was, if we think back to that ADCAR model, the awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement that Alina's referring to, we jumped straight to knowledge. What we did is we rolled out, here's how you use the tool, here's where you go to get help, things like that. We totally missed the mark in the early days of our KCS rollout and didn't address the why, the WIFM, if you will, or as Alina points out in the change management language, the awareness, the desire component. So, so that's the first thing that comes to mind for me, Alina. Yes, and this, this is a very uh, interesting uh, the interesting point that you make because it's so human to say, well, just send them to training. Just tell tell them what what they need and where it is. And in fact, you know, if anyone um, could show people where knowledge could be found, that's Kendall. So that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the problem that people didn't know where to go and get information. The problem is that they didn't know how having to change the way that they work, having to put knowledge in the workflow. They didn't really know how that was a good thing necessarily. I mean, at the end of the day, maybe, but not right away. And certainly not when you're you're asking me to change six, seven, eight different things about how I'm doing my job, right? So also, I, I venture to say that there were some things that happened along the way where, you know, a lot of changes, a lot of transitions. So people were just like in change saturation mode. So you can probably re relate to this, um, and and I'll we'll, we'll go into that as as we pro as we progress in the interview. So just keep in mind that we're just kind of going to be transparent and open, and hopefully you learn from us. And uh, just as a as a you know review, Kendall, how how did you? Well, you talked a little bit how you launched the KCS program without awareness and desire, but 
what were some of the challenges you faced after the initial excitement were off and people were asked to change <laughs> their ways? Good question. Yeah. Ironically enough, somebody beat me to it in the chat. So kudos to John Coles there was, was the metrics. Um, we, we quickly started to realize that not only did we need to help people change, not only did we need to change processes, not only did we need to change technology, but um, we forgot in the very beginning, or shall I say, didn't notice that the metrics at the beginning needed to change as well, because they were in some respects contradictory the change or the strategy we were trying to bring. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one that stands out uh, with regards to uh, another component of change. And um, in a roundabout way, what that turned into is for the KCS program managers and, and other strategic program managers at F5, we had to start to adopt some of the things you're talking about around HEDCAR and PCT. And um, I'll, I'll say lead up rather than manage up, but lead up our chain of, of um, our organization saying, hey, are you aware that the metrics are contradicting these things? So we essentially had to step into the role of being a change manager and, and apply some of those concepts you're talking about to help leaders realize the need to change what they care about or what their metrics that they're being held to. Sure. And how did those senior leaders uh, respond when asked to actively and visibly communicate their support of KCS program? I mean, think about, you know, uh, just even outside the U.S. and our other theaters, how, how did they respond to being asked to be active and visible, supportive of of the KCS program? What was their that's response? A good, that's a good question, too. And I, I think it actually ties back to something you said earlier around everybody goes through change at different speed, at different speeds, at different mm -hmm. paces. Um, so some leaders uh, were all on board. They're like, this makes a lot of sense. If I want to help my business, help my people, et cetera, et cetera, thrive, then we've got to adopt this. And they were some of them were willing to shift those metrics. Others were highly skeptical. Um, had questions, had had objections, had misconceptions, et cetera. Um, so it it started to become very lifelike for us of what you were talking about earlier, that everybody goes through change at different speeds. Um, some people might need more time to process the ask that we're giving to them. Others might be ready to jump on board. So in a roundabout way, we started to, uh, while we didn't know it at the time, because we didn't have your infinite wisdom around change management, um, but we started to realize that that ad car journey you're talking about, like one person could be in the desire phase while somebody else is still even completely unaware of the need to change. So we kind of had to shift tactics and and speak to individuals with where they were at on their journey. Sure. And, you know, the coaches being that their, you know, their business acumen is, as well as their coaching muscles were were being, you know, developed and flexed. Some of them might have managed the resistance, but you know, without with without leadership uh, being sort of prepped and prepared by change management from the beginning or a change manager from the very, very beginning, uh, sort of this, this was uh, in and of itself a change, I would imagine. Just the idea that they as leaders needed to play a certain role. Like, in, in other words, like they were given a script, they weren't prepared to, to enact <laughs> right away uh, because they were, kind of deep into the work, into whatever was comfortable, whatever was expected. So this whole change management methodology approach in and of itself was you, would you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's funny you bring up the coaches side of the equation. And um, when when we were exposed to change management through you, it, it started to become more and more apparent that um, like when we talk KCS coaches, we started to shift our KCS coaches to expand their scope to more than just KCS because we started to realize that the org was going through an immense amount of change over the last five years, not just rolling out KCS, but also new tools, um, new systems, new products, et cetera. So we said, well, what if we were to apply our coaches and as an extension of our change management strategy? Um, all those same skills that we teach coaches, listening, inquiry, reflection, advocacy, appreciation, became a technique for us to um, scale uh, change management to an extent, not just beyond sure. where we're applying change management, but how we're applying it. That's excellent, because my very next question is, as if you read my mind, is how did people managers then respond when asked to allow the time for coaching? Everything you're saying is wonderful, but it needs time to unfold. I'd be lying to this group if I said that it went off without a hitch. Um, in the very beginning, the, the concept of change management and coaching and the need to change. We had, we had a pretty sizable amount of skepticism across our, our business. 
Um, that being said, we had a couple of uh, unique leaders who were willing to take a chance, willing to try something, willing to take a step of faith, if you will, um, out there and say, well, I could see how this could help my team. Let's let's give it a try. And we had one particular support director who said, let's try it. Um, I'll give you six people uh, within my my remit that that, um, that I think we can train up to become better coaches and and help my region change. Um, and ironically enough, after a quarter or two, we started looking at those people's uh, impact for helping the individuals change, the coaches impact for helping the, the their coaches change. And almost every single metric that we would usually use pre KCS traditional metrics started ever so slightly moving in a little bit more of a positive, a healthier direction. Um, so that willingness was a key component for that one unique support director, that his willingness to try something new then it brought about some results that we could tell stories about to others. And then in turn, you started to see the tide shift just a little bit back in 2017, 2018, 2019. And now today we have a whole, whole different organization as far as readiness or willingness to change with regards to KCS. Excellent. Well, you answered what happened to the adoption metrics and the proficiency of knowledge workers throughout the program as leadership got involved. But how did the senior leadership perceive the ROI of the KCS and coaching program relative to their expectations? Because when it was positioned, so now I'm talking just the KCS coaching program, which I absolutely recommend if you're not already involved in it. <clears throat> but how do they how do they perceive it? <clears throat> That's a good question. I haven't given uh, enough thought to that one, but I will say one of the things that we're starting to notice is um, we've postured coaching and, and, and change management as a investment, if you will, at times. In fact, um, we, we did a presentation on this a few months back, I think. Um, but I'm starting to also notice that there is an outcome or an ROI just from change management and from coaching as well. And sometimes we fall in the trap of thinking of it as only as an, as an investment, but the outcome is that the next change that comes later is a little bit easier than the first one. So in a roundabout way, it's it's both uh, being starting to be seen as an investment and also an ROI or an, an outcome, outcome, or dare I say activities and outcomes, right? Yes. Uh, two, two more questions. <laughs> so how, how was resistance managed with and without change management involvement? You know, mm. when we so you had before and after, how if you can give one or two examples or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, for all of my colleagues on the call who also live in engineering or technology, or maybe you're like me and you like to be able to give a good answer. Um, what we fell into the <laughs> trap of in the beginning of uh, rolling out a change was advocacy, giving the answer. Um, so let's say somebody who's got a misconception or, or an objection, if you will, or perhaps even resistance, um, they might ask a question and we would roll out an answer, not really giving the full weight or merit to the human side of that question that could actually be a misconception or have some emotional context behind it. Um, mm -hmm. So before thinking about change management, oftentimes we would get a question or a requester and we would be the responder and give an answer, right? But we, we would uh, forget about the sentiment component of that. So more recently, as, as you've taught us really, really well, as we shift to strategically thinking about how do we get to the with them for each individual, we slow down now and we don't jump to advocating for the answer as much anymore. We don't jump to just giving it. Instead, we listen, we reflect, we inquire, we, we use a lot of that Clark model you were talking about. Um, for people managers in order to get to the heart of the resistance so that then we can actually address that together with somebody who might be resisting. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. And that's a great so segue to what actually drives KCS success um, at, at F5. So I'll let you I'll let you fill in um, the knowledge gap for, for the rest of us on what drives KCS success. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's probably a good, um, like you said, segue is we thought about if, if KCS was the outcome we wanted to achieve and we worked our way backwards from there to the right to try to explore, well, what do we do to get to that success model? 
we realized, much like you said earlier, we needed good, healthy, active, engaged leadership and communication, both from our executive sponsors and everybody up and down that products or that that uh, organizational stack. Um, but what we also realized, much like somebody else just said in the chat, we needed to give coaching, change management tools, et cetera, to those leaders because they themselves were having to go through a change also. Well. How does this all connect? Uh, we we hear that the KCS coaching program on the left is to listen, to reflect, inquiry, appreciation, and ad advocacy. So as the as the KCS coaching model reinforces the knowledge worker's confidence to persist and grow in practicing the solve and evolve loop. On the right, we have the pro site change management resistance tactics uh, that is essentially focused on equipping and coaching those superheroes. The people managers. These tactics are uh, definitely there's thought to how they they were um, listed. There's sort of a sequent, a very subtle sequential, uh, you know, a framework to them, if you will. And you can see that it's almost like the first one is to listen before anything. Listen, understand objections. Uh, focusing on the what and letting go of the how is extraordinarily difficult for engineers, uh, people who are highly analytical, they don't want to let go of the how. In fact, you have to show me everything about how this is going to make me successful before I do anything, before I give you anything. It's it's tough to deal with, with that particular element. So um, you for those people, then you would then remove the barriers uh, by ensuring that the tools, the process, the ways of working uh, actually work well together. Uh, in this case, uh, some use cases would be good. Some industry success stories would be good to come uh, to the table with. So um, uh, then after that, if that still presents, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure, it's not It's clear, you have to provide some simple and clear choices and consequences up front. What happens if we don't? This is where the scary tactics come out. Here is what happens if we don't do this. We understand it's hard. We understand some things are still being worked, especially if you're dealing in agile. There's iteration to consider. There are constant technology challenges, um, new innovation coming at us very quickly. How does that affect what we do? You have to keep things very simple and create hope in that the structure is based on principles and the principles will not get violated. The principles are what uphold everything. Those tenants don't change. Things can change in the world, but when you have a structured uh, approach to dealing with the changes, a sort of foundational model, it always helps and creates hope in individuals to stick with it. You then begin to show the benefits of the change. And this is what at F5, the KCS coaches and the program team has done just a tremendous uh, A plus work on showing the benefits of the KCS program data insights. Your data team is absolutely invaluable. Data insights anymore are, are the product. They are just as important as anything you do, if not the most important. And that's why a change management methodology with embedded data um, tracking mechanisms is going to be your best friend when showing the value of, of change management. And believe it or not, you constantly have to show the value of change man management, because if you don't, Leaders won't make allowances for it, and they will not resource it, and then you'll not have a change manager one day. But you also have to be willing to demonstrate consequences um, after you've converted the strongest dissenters. And I missed the initiative part. It's uh, sorry, the incentive part. I missed it for a reason because incentives like recognition is one thing, but uh, incentives here doesn't mean that. Uh, when ProSci put this together, incentives is like, we're gonna give you a, a extra money or a bonus. Maybe your MBOs here could have a play and align in compensation, but I don't believe in people being incentivized for doing the basic right things. And if we just throw incentives at people too soon or prematurely, they end up doing things for the wrong reasons. So that's why I kind of skipped over it. It's there as a, as a, a, a tactic, if you will. But I think when you get to number nine, this is where, look, this is how we're doing it. And I have an expression, 
that I tell my kids, look, I'm not just going to threaten the sky with clouds. It's going to rain. <laughs> so this is where you provide people consequences that if they're not going to be with you, then they're going to be sort of against you and you need to find them a different role, either in or out of the organization. So by this point, you've exhausted all of other things. This is kind of a last res resort just before making a personal appeal. Look, John, really need you to do this. Look, Jane, um, if you don't do this, uh, I'm going to look bad. It's it's a call of desperation. So <laughs> let's hope we never get there. Anyway, so these are just some of the tactics that we can do as coaches. We can also uh, equip the people managers uh, to the F5 team. They all have a 10 tactic, you know, laminated or whatever, uh, digitally laminated <laughs> form. So this is very important to have. I spend a lot of time on this because resistance management is a necessary uh, part. Now, the KCS library has a fantastic article on managing resistance and, and handling objections. Here's a, yet another way to look at this. So in the next slide, we're going to just do a very brief uh, synopsis of what we learned so far. Because you're going to probably go, this this is just a lot of stuff. How about some practical application? What do I do when I get back to work? Well, first of all, let's just briefly cover what we've what we've done so far. We've learned the methodology connections between KCS and change management a little bit. We've learned that the people side of change is complex and a structured methodology is needed. So like the PCT, the Project Change Triangle for Measuring Project Health, the ADCAR for individual transitions to the, uh, the that human ROI, the speed of adoption, ultimate utilization and proficiency. And then we also learned from our team at F5 how missing elements of ADCAR can slow down momentum, um, the lack of leadership, coaching to solidify those ABCs that they're being active and visible, the building the coalition of change uh, management. And we learned about the Clark muscles for people managers. So some practical to-dos when you get back to your desk or off this call. Connect with your sponsor. If you've just had a conversation in the morning, maybe schedule a 15-minute meeting. Let this process, let, let this kind of sleep in your mind a little bit, what we've learned today. And then just kind of do a, a quick check-in with your sponsor. Check them on their ABCs. You're not going to grade them. You're not going to tell them you're doing this. You have to be very subtle, especially if, if the sponsor's feeling, you know, like they're already active and visible and communicating. But do a checkpoint with your sponsor. Then let your leaders know that the importance of messaging directly, so that, that direct communication to the people managers first, enforcing uh, messages to the people managers and then trickling down is critical. Um, it has to be done this way for alignment, uh, especially if you've got very aggressive KCS milestones on the roadmap. Then uh, step number three is coach the people managers prior to coaching knowledge workers. If your knowledge workers are aligned and, and engaged in your coaching program, that's great, but make sure the people managers are also um, on the same wavelength. Very, very important that their coaching muscles are working as well as the coaches. <laughs> um, make sure that your compensations align. So if you have MBOs, awards, recognitions, reinforcements, make sure that it aligns uh, with the milestones and objectives as well, because there's nothing like calling individuals out for doing excellent work in the KCS program. Um, we could have spent some time there too with the F5 team, and maybe at the end, uh, I'll let Kendall revisit some of presentation um, uh, that he brought to the consortium about how important this particular one is, recognition and reinforcement. And then don't be afraid to broadcast success stories, highlight individual impact, that's also uh, something that would just give a boost to to any stagnation in momentum. Um, so so that would be my practical advice to you. And um, and then what uh, I, I promised you, I promised you that the, the what, at least one third of our of our focus today would be on um, leaving with sort of a suitcase full of good digital uh, knowledge and resources. And so um, 
the resource library here is just, I just had three slides. I put a little uh, visual of what the, the actual uh, link is about so that you have a, just a, a reference point. And then in a little bit of time, I'm going to open it up for Q&A and, and let you know how we can continue the conversation so that it doesn't stop here. The um, Perside Business Change Assessment is a fillable tool that helps you to capture the ADCAR story. It gives you um, a way at the end and a scoring mechanism uh, that allows you to then basically score uh, all of your elements from a one to five. And the very, very first time you see a score of three, whatever element shows up with the three first, that's your barrier point. So if you score, you know, yep, I'm ready to go. I'm aware of everything, but I don't know where the training is. So I'm going to score a two. That's your barrier point. Once a barrier point has been identified, that's where your work begins. So more about that, um, you know, if you have a change manager uh, in, in play, they can, they can definitely help with this. Um, the next one would be the sponsor assessment. Use this assessment with discretion and much diplomacy. That's that's the, the full disclosure warning sign. This comes with a warning label. No sponsor wants to be made to feel like there's anything lacking in their role. And leaders uh, got to the position they're in because of a lot of good decisions, uh, their accomplishments, and they deserve respect. They're not infallible creatures, however, and they could stand our help but you don't want to come out of the gates like, okay, take the sponsor assessment so I can see if you're doing your ABCs and how good you are. No, don't do that. Um, you can help leaders uh, by guiding them through these questions. I would say give it to them, um, you know, to self-evaluate. This isn't going to be broadcasted anywhere. It's between the, the coach or the change manager and the sponsor. This is so that the, the sponsor can receive some coaching if necessary. Leadership coaching is very important. Uh, a lot of the coaches' uh, boots on the ground are really focused on the knowledge workers, but leaders need co uh, coaching as well. So this is an assessment that could be utilized, and that is also works on the scoring system, and it gives um, gives some ideas on how to, to manage their roadblocks as well. Uh, the last one is a change management competency assessment for managers. And managers, remember, have that dual role. So it helps them to uh, identify their areas of need. And for all the reasons discussed, that's, that's a good assessment to have. Uh, finally, if you're into documenting and tracking your actions, um, you want to use that Clark coaching model for managers. Here's another fillable um, PDF, well, it's a fillable PDF that en enables you to basically unite the Clark and the ADCAR on one view. It's it's very helpful. I've used this a lot. And um, let's see. Yeah, the, what, what also I found was helpful is to have some, some questions that you may have already asked in the chat. And since I don't have eyes on the chat, I don't know. So forgive me if some of these have already been asked by you, but I, I've I was hoping that we could instantly put things to practice and having uh, sort of an overview on, you know, what does this coaching program and change management have to do uh, with my life? I am really hoping you walk away with some some more ideas and uh, it just just can see the need for change management as a structured methodology. But also, if you don't have a person to to work with, I wanted to make sure that I made myself available to you. And on the last slide, I put my LinkedIn profile and I'm offering everyone on this call a 15 minute coaching session. Uh, you can book me on LinkedIn, send me a private uh, message. And here are some of the ways that we can spend our 15 minutes together. I could give you a sort of a tour guide through what is all out there on this ProSci methodology, uh, a guided tour through ProSci.com, which is a wealth of wealth of information, but like the consortium library, it could be overwhelming. <laughs> so if you need a tour guide through that, book some time for that. If you're in a difficult transition, you're halfway, midway uh, through uh, an issue of uh, just a massive roadblock or you need help of any kind, um, 
pertaining to to the program, let me know, and I could we could spend some time unpacking that, and I could coach you through that. And uh, if you also just want to use your assessments, uh, to, you know, if if you have a change manager already, that's great. If you don't, and you want to be able to uh, to be proficient in using the assessments and the tools themselves, that we could go over how how to um, take your information and and fill fill them in so that they're totally customizable to your project right now. So with that, um, I thank you for your time. I want to open it up to the floor for Q&A with the remaining time, if that's okay. And for, for me, for Kendall, for anybody at F5, um, what do we have in the chat? What can we answer for we, you? We did have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one from Stanislava uh, for you, Alina, is in your experience across the industry with change management, um, how have you observed applying change management versus not applying change management and its relationship to this the adoption and speed of adoption? What does that look like in your experience? Yes, uh, in my experience, I found that complex changes across several business units, especially if you're dealing with multiple theaters, the more complex uh, project, the, the absence of change management will nine out of 10 slow momentum and, and slow down everything you want to do. You can have your technology working perfectly. You can have everything just set and ready to go, your training programs, but without leaders communicating the need for the change, without the leaders knowing their, their roles, without that change management stage manager telling the actors where to sit and what to do and, and, giving them that little three by five card <laughs> referencing the old days of, of when to show up and how to show up and what meetings and what to say. There's so much noise. There's so much noise uh, sort of fr from the workers and the people managers will, will pull the most amazing stunts. They'll tell their teams like, yeah, 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 this is, this is probably going to stick, probably not going to stick. You know, if it's something we have to do, I'll let you know. What do you think is going to happen? Those people are going to smile and say hello and and, and nod their heads in and, and all the town hall meetings. And the leader is going to feel very good about themselves. But if if they haven't convinced the people managers about the strategic connection and have a plan on how to lead the people through those changes, you're in for trouble. So that's what I see. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I think it does. Um, another question that came through in the chat was from John Coles, and it was kind of around the, the topic of uh, getting to the heart of what managers and other leaders are rated on and what their metrics are. Um, as, a, as a change management strategist, what are some techniques you use to try to pull that out of them sometimes if it's if it's harder to get to? Um, I, I would say that that the data of of adoption has to be uh, harnessed somewhere. I mean, where where, where the data resides and it implies that somewhere along the line, uh, the metrics have been set in such a way that the data reflects adoption side by side. How people are tracking adoption has very much to do with uh, the success criteria from the beginning. So if, for example, we say we're moving from this CRM to this CRM and we want, we're an agile and we want people to adopt. Well, there are things about the tool for several of the impacted groups that are not built out yet. So you can't have an across the board metric on adoption. You can only have that adoption metric on people who have full use of the tool at the time. So making you know generalizations does not work especially if you're dealing with an uh, with an agile or or any type of digital transformation projects that that has to be broken into individual impacted groups and each group has to be uh, taken sort of apart and then you do your at car group surveys on just that group and report out um, people managers have to be able to know pretty much everything that their team is struggling with and then be able to have some some framework of managing people through the barriers. Awesome. 
And then one more question I see slipping in here at the at the towards the we wrap up here um, from Lena. Uh, when when we're seeing a whole bunch of changes happening all at once from different areas, whether it's org restructure, whether it's tooling, whether it's initiatives, et cetera. Um, how have you observed the healthy techniques for being able to manage that breadth of change saturation? What, what are some techniques you use for that? This is my favorite question to answer. It's the most complicated and 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 the simplest to articulate. Complicated in execution, simple to articulate because anytime you have a strategic objective that's clearly defined and a project that feeds straight into that artery, everything about that project needs to be measured and tracked and it has to have that triangle in place. Leaders have to be aligned with the technical side of the house. They have to be aligned with the people side of the house, the change management. When these things connect that project to the main artery, that's where all the attention goes. So change saturation becomes relative because the focus, the prioritization is on the project that is able to position itself with these in place. We've got the right leaders in the room. We got the right sponsor on this thing. We've got the, the TS uh, and the developers doing what they need to do to get our tooling ready. We've got the KCS program managers and coaches doing their thing. We've got a change manager who's who's coming in at different points, at different iterations to get people coached through those changes from execs to people managers and working very closely with all three. When you have these three, that project spells clear success criteria, clear outcomes to leadership. Leadership says, this is where I'm focusing. If you don't, it may be the best idea in the world, but another project will take over and another one and another one. And that's where the org is that change saturation. Change managers strategically positioned will keep change saturation from happening or happening at the rate that's happening. So that's hopefully helpful to you. Great. Any other questions that we have? We have just another minute before we need to wrap up. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Lena and Kendall. This is a wealth of information. And again, I, I encourage you to take advantage of uh, Lena's offer to uh, reach out to get more information as you need. So, and uh, yes. hope to see you all on the uh, next KCS in action in June, where again, we'll be talking about um, the content standard checklist and uh, SAP was doing some very unique ways they, they found uh, it's going to be very interesting in the talk. Uh, coaches were not very consistent on how they were doing their assessment and uh, SAP came up with a very innovative way to bring consistency and kind of that continuous improvement. So hopefully you will uh, be able to join us there also. But thanks again, Alina and Kendall, really appreciate all yeah. the information. And thank you for your time and attentiveness today for everyone who participated. Thank you the, uh, for the F5 team for showing up strong yet humble as usual. Always an inspiration and example to follow. Uh, I invite you on their behalf also to stay connected um, in, in, in your close circle of network, their wealth of information. And again, thank you, Arndt and the consortium leadership for this opportunity. And let's continue the conversation. Send me messages and I'll, uh, I'll schedule first come first serve <laughs> thanks everyone all right thank you all have a good rest of the day thank you